morning, everyone. Um, my name is Cambria Allen Ratzloff. I am Corporate Governance Director for the $61 billion UAW Retiree Medical Benefits Trust. The trust is the largest non-governmental payer for retiree health care in the United States. Um, my background before then, uh, I uh, came from came to the trust from the Connecticut State Treasurer's Office, where I worked under Treasurer Denise L. Napier uh, on corporate governance issues. Uh, prior to that, I was with the Council of Institutional Investors as an analyst, and I also serve as an officer on CII's board currently. So uh, I'm going to begin this session by introducing uh, my colleagues. Uh, to my left, Eric Bradbury. Um, Eric is a partner at EY's Financial Accounting Advisory Services Practice, uh, with over 15 years of experience serving some of EY's largest global 360 clients. Previously, Eric served as a fellow at Financial Executives International, where he worked closely with a network of controllers from the largest and most respected companies in the Fortune 500. And then to Eric's left, we have Dr. Anthony Hesketh. Anthony is, well, Ant actually, <laughs> is an associate professor in the management school at Lancaster University, a visiting uh, professor at Copenhagen Business School, an advisor to EY and named by HR Magazine as one of the profession's top 10 thinkers. His research broadly focuses on value with a specific focus on capturing the financial impact of leadership, strategy, and human capital on organizational performance. And his recent work focuses on establishing new ways of understanding and calculating evolving forms of value in modern capitalism. So today, uh, as the title suggests, we're going to be talking about human capital management. And um, uh, all of us have been working quite a bit on uh, human capital management from various perspectives. We have the investor perspective, um, the academic perspective, um, the auditor consultant um, perspective. But I think the key uh, area here, the key issue here, is that human capital management has become uh, increasingly important in, um, in the U.S. market and uh, certainly among uh, the investor community. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about you know, what's going on, uh, what can you expect coming down the road, and um, Eric will talk about, uh, Eric and Ant will both talk about their, their work with the Embankment Project for Inclusive Capitalism, some really fascinating stuff. So um, as part of, in addition to my day job, I am uh, chair of the Human Capital Management Coalition. The coalition is a group of 26 uh, large institutional investors, a global group representing over $3.4 trillion in assets uh, that came together around 2013 uh, out of concern that human capital management really uh, hadn't been given the attention uh, it, it really deserved from the investor community. There'd been a lot of work going on on human capital management before then, but the investor voice was you know, really the one that was missing. I should also point out that CalPERS was a founding member of the HCMC in 2013, and CalSTRS has been a huge asset to the group um, since 2016. Um, you know, as, as investors, we view human capital as a key production input and an asset that really should be uh, invested and maximized uh, versus a cost to be minimized. And our concern was that it was viewed more as the latter than the former. Um, and also, you know, part of that is because we really didn't have that much information as investors. If you're not asking for it, you're not getting it. And human capital had become a bit of a black box. Uh, so our, our goal was kind of to change that. Um, so in our first phase of work, um, we engaged a group of retail companies. We chose those companies because there are a large number of frontline customer-facing employees. And I think there was sort of a, a view that, you know, they're almost like, you know, interchangeable. Um, and we, you know, we really didn't think that that was right. Um, when, as in our conversations, we realized, uh, we talked to about seven companies, there's a pretty big range in how companies were viewing human capital management. Uh, the first company we talked to was Costco, uh, which has a huge reputation for being just uh, absolutely um, great at creating value for investors while also developing their talent. 
And I think there are a few key key things that they were doing. First of all, human capital was, their people were first and foremost. And um, even though everyone says that you know people are their greatest asset, they were really putting uh, a push behind this. So that was part of their DNA. Um, employees had a lot more uh, agency than I think they typically do uh, in a lot of other retail companies. Um, there was a lot of communication. It was part of the culture of the organization. Um, some of the other companies we talked to wasn't necessarily that they weren't uh, thinking about human capital, but since investors hadn't asked about it, we got you know kind of I'd say response from what are you talking about? Why are you asking us? You know we really hadn't viewed it this way. Um, don't worry if we're raising wages, we're saving money for you, uh, or we can afford it. Versus thinking about human capital as really a a way to drive value of the firm. Um, so after that. We realized, you know, as I mentioned, it was a bit of a black box. So investors hadn't been asking for this information. I think maybe it's time that we do. Um, so in 2016, we started preparing a petition for rulemaking to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, which we filed in 2017, July 2017. And the petition asked the SEC to start rulemaking um, on uh, developing metrics on human capital. Um, Prior to then and currently, really the only information that we have that's compulsory from uh, U.S. Uh, uh, public firms is the number of employees. That doesn't really tell us much about how well companies are, are managing this resource. Um, so we were, you know, our goal was to really make a strong investor argument. One thing I should state, we don't view this as a kind of an ESG issue. Uh, it's, it's a fundamental issue to the firm. Um, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, a key input. So we argued, you know, listen, we can't evaluate a uh, company's business, uh, their risks, their prospects without this information. Um, we, with this information, we can make better capital allocation decisions, better direct capital to its highest value use that is efficient for both us and for the market. Um, efficiency for us as well in collecting information. Currently, if you're looking for human capital related information, if it's available, you might be looking at a CSR report, you might be looking through websites. Um, sometimes, you know, if you're Intel, they report their turnover in their 10K now, that's great. But uh, it's, it's usually kind of, um, you're doing a treasure hunt and that's not great for us either. Um, so standardization also does help with data collection. And it also provides clear expectations to companies as to what information we're looking for. Every single engagement we have, what do you guys want? We, we pretty much know what we want, um, but you know, if they're hearing from us asking for X, and you know another group is saying why, and then this framework wants this. It's it's really not not efficient. Um, we offered nine broad categories of information, ranging from workforce composition to um, diversity and inclusion to training and development um, to human rights. And these categories were intentionally broad because our goal ultimately when we put out this petition was to spark a conversation, um, was to say, hey, investors care, um, let's work this issue out. Um, since then, it's, uh, I think there's been a lot of uh, increasingly vocal um, efforts from not just the investor community, but um, you know, Epic has been working on this for quite a while as well. Um, uh, in this area, you have BlackRock prioritizing this as an engagement priority, you have State Street prioritizing this issue. So really, investors are looking at this, asset managers are looking at this. Um, SASB has also announced that it is prioritizing human capital management in their next round of, of, um, of uh, standard development. Um, and so brings us to this year um, in March, the Investor Advisory Committee of the Securities and Exchange Commission voted to uh, recommend to the commission that it take us up on the petition, um, that it uh, embark on a, uh, on a formal, more formal dialogue, um, might lead to re rulemaking, um, uh, but really just having that conversation uh, in a more kind of organized, larger uh, way. Uh, there was also legislation in May from the U.S. Financial Services Committee that uh, took the nine categories from the petition and kind of 
uh, put them into legislations um, saying, hey, okay, we, we, we need to have this dialogue. Um, one thing I should mention uh, before I turn it over to Eric, uh, from the IAC, uh, Chairman Jay Clayton has made several statements Two companies saying, you know, you need to up your your disclosure on human capital. And uh, at the IAC hearing, you said specifically that the constituencies he wants to hear from are the boards, um, but also the allocators. Uh, so it's very important that um, that you know this community and board members uh, really do get involved in this in this dialogue. So that's my spiel, um, and I will now turn it over to Eric, who's going to talk uh, about Epic's amazing work. And, uh, yeah, thank you. It away. I, it, it's actually really helpful to hear your story and kind of the process you went through. I will say, um, as part of my background, what you didn't mention, which I'll um, confess to the, the group here, is that I'm a human capital convert, and that's um, I, I, <laughs> I wear that badge proudly. Um, I had just come, as you mentioned, from working with um, as a fellow at Financial Executives International, um, working with their committee on corporate reporting. So I was sitting in a room for two years with uh, chief accounting officers of most of the Fortune 100 uh, working on their agenda. And one of our projects was disclosure effectiveness. And I can remember um, discussions we had around their views. And I'm a CPA by background as well. So when I came back to EY post-fellowship and they assigned me to the uh, EPIC project, I was thrilled. <laughs> not, not really. I was thinking, um, are you sure you've got the right person? Uh, but um, what's really interesting is, is you start to get folks that come from, with my background into this space and you start to realize how important it is. I can remember sitting in a room with um, Lady Lynn Rothschild, and I'll, I'll come back to this, but... Epic was a, a joint collaboration um, started by EY and um, the Coalition for Inclusive Capitalism. Lady Lynn Rothschild, who some of you may know, um, started the, the coalition. And um, she, she came to our first meeting and kind of described the, the problem statement, um, you know, coming out of the financial crisis and realizing something needed to be done to create a more inclusive capital environment. And, and you know, what can we do? And EY jumped in and said, well, we've got this framework we've been building and let's use that and test it. And, um, and hearing the story and hearing the approach that was taken um, started to get me there. And I thought, oh, this might be important. Um, and then actually, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cue a video here in a second, but then they also shared with me the video that UI had been working on. Um, and that really um, hit home for me because I started to connect it to what I had been doing in the sort of financial reporting world to this, this world of um, um, non-financial value, um, long-term value. So I'm gonna actually start with a, a video. Some of you may have seen this, um, and then I'll kind of, my goal is to just share a little bit about uh, what we did in, in the Epic space, particularly around human capital, man uh, human capital development, um, how we got to where we, we are today. Um, hopefully it'll be a nice tee up for Ant who's done some really good research in this space. So if we could cue the video please and then um, hopefully this works. If we want to understand how a company's value will grow over the long term, what metrics do we look at? Financial statements are still our most widely used tools but might not reflect all the intangible assets that form an increasingly important part of a company's value. The things that drive this value are rapidly changing. With the advent of the knowledge economy, factors such as intellectual property, brand awareness, or investment in talent increasingly define value. But traditional financial reporting metrics weren't designed to measure them. And this lack of understanding is fueling an investment disconnect. Companies have good strategies for long-term investment, but if they don't have the metrics to demonstrate them, the investment community ends up focusing only on the short-term metrics they can see. Data is increasingly available, and more of it appears every day. So investors are making their own judgments by mining publicly available sources, and organizations risk losing control of their equity story. There's rapidly declining trust in business. Since the financial crisis, the trust gap between business and the rest of society has widened. So business has to re-establish its societal contract. 
Traditional financial reporting is no longer enough to explain a company's long-term value plan. But for new metrics to be trusted, investors need to have confidence that companies aren't cherry-picking what they disclose. EY has developed a long-term value framework to help identify the right metrics to reflect long-term value creation. The framework starts with an understanding of the context to which the organization is responding, as well as its purpose, strategy, and the governance that underpins it. These factors will help determine which stakeholders are core to the organization's value creation model and the outcomes it's aiming to deliver for them. This defines the outcome metrics, which will help communicate how successful an organization has been in delivering for its stakeholders. Find out more about how EY is using the framework to help drive sustainable business growth and build a better working world. Okay, um, so I think that tees up nicely um, the, the, the long-term value framework that we um, uh, worked with at, at EY and, and during our EPIC project. Um, if you sort of, I really like this slide because it kind of um, depicts the journey and I think you mentioned this timeline kind of matches up, Cambria, to your, uh, your journey as well. Um, but if you go back to, to 2015, um, how did we get to where, um, where we are today with EPIC? Really started with uh, research EY commission with Cambridge University, um, really looking into what are the new measures of value? What does financial reporting look like in the, uh, um, in the future? That le led to sort of um, academic roundtables, investor roundtables, um, business leader insights. Um, and then EY developed a, a white paper um, point of view uh, around long-term value. Um, fast forward a bit to um, some additional CEO meetings that happened. Our CEO got together with Lady Ren Rothschild come, you know, coming out of the financial crisis, what are we gonna do? Problem statement, let's do this journey together. We have happen to have this long-term value framework. Why don't we offer it up, open source it, and use it as a testing ground to help um, see what we can do in this space. Um, so and and so that was really what kicked off the um, project, uh, the, the embankment project. Um, I think that the name was something to do with where they were sitting across the embankment river or something like that. And I will say, it we didn't know it was going to be epic at the end, and we were trying to figure out the name of the, and it just <laughs> it, it was perfect. Uh, so the the group, um, so they they gathered up what was really, um, and I'll come back to this, um, but. What was really important about this project was if we were going to do this, we wanted to make sure that it included uh, investors across the, um, the, the stakeholders across the invest, investment spectrum, all the way from asset creators to asset managers, asset owners, et cetera. Um, so that's really, and, and the work is ongoing. I guess that's the, that's the point here is um, there's going to be some fa additional phases, et cetera. Um, and for those of you, I, I don't know how many are familiar with um, the EPIC report, but um, we did produce a report um, that, you know, the, the EPIC sort of metrics launched in November of last year. Um, there was some press around it, et cetera, but, um, you know, that is available. Um, and again, the work is ongoing. So, um, again, the, the basis for the work that we did was um, starting with this long term value framework. Um, what Without going into too much detail, what I will say is that this was the framework that allowed us to create the um, the environment to have discussions with asset creators, managers, and owners around how do we hone in on what are the what are the appropriate metrics um, that we're going to um, identify in, in in a variety of different spaces. Um, we started off all of the embankment members started off by doing a diagnostic that helped them identify really what I would say are the, the edges of this framework, the strategy, the context, the, the, the purpose. Um, and I think that diagnostic piece of this process was really important. It got the sort of juices flowing. Um, it helped um, us connect the um, connect what we were trying to do um, with, uh, with the organization that we were working with. Um, so it was a really important process. Again, there's a lot to this model, um, but all of it is designed to ultimately get to what what drives your 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 metrics uh, framework, etc. Um, 
I'm just going to jump through these. Okay, so who was involved in Epic? Um, this Again, this is really important. Um, 31 companies across the investment chain, nine what we would call asset creators, 11 asset owners, 11 asset managers, representing 30 trillion uh, in assets under man management. Um, I think this, um, again, this was, if you look at some of the other initiatives out there, this is perhaps what may be different than some of the other approaches that have been taken, which we felt was really important. And especially from an EY perspective, was a, um, a must, a must have. Um, so going in, what was our hypothesis? Well, uh, one, outcome metrics are insightful indicators of long-term value. Um, information is available, more available than it's ever been before. We understand disclosure is an issue. Um, three levels of metrics. Um, common metrics, uh, company-specific uh, metrics, sector metrics. Um, and then data and analytics is a key enabler. I know you'll like that part, right? And um, so we'll kind of get to this, but again, it, the steps for us at a, on a very high level, not this isn't rocket science, diagnostic, apply the long-term value framework, and then develop outcome metrics. Um, so uh, after we, um, so we met, I think, for a few different working group meetings. Um, after we sort of finished the diagnostic piece, uh, we determined it necessary to set up working groups around um, seven metric-based working groups. These are the seven here. You'll see at the top, human capital management. That's the group that I was involved in. Um, but we, we also um, uh, you know, had the six others, which also came up with their metrics and their process was very similar to ours. Um, okay. Um, the, this was another really key piece to our, our process. Um, not only did we feel like we needed the, the um, seven different working groups, we also needed to have a backdrop of, of a methodology working group that would oversee the process we were going through, that would help us define what are the principles around good metrics. All of the, thing, all of the metrics we came up with had to run through these filters. Um, this team was there to sort of help support us and drive us in the right direction. Um, think of it in terms of a filtering process. You know, if, if you think this metric is good, let's make sure. Um, it was also really important to us, knowing that we were um, riding the coattails of, of many other initiatives out there, it was very important for us to make sure within the working groups, but also as a separate working group, that we were looking to other initiatives out there um, and, and incorporating that into our process and, and, and respecting what work had already been done. It's a little bit small on the slide here, but those are some of the other working groups that were, um, uh, other initiatives that were mentioned there. Okay, so um, within the working groups, and again, I think this was the um, same process that happened through all the working groups. What, what was our process? Well, it started with um, you know extensive sort of lay of the land research, finding out what was out there, review of academic literature, um, review of, of, of um, initiatives, existing metrics, et cetera. Um, we then used that to, to hone our list down, a long list to short list, really very simple process, um, but not um, very easy to do. Um, we had a few um, different approaches to do that. Ant may talk about some of this as well, but um, how, how many, how many uh, metrics did we start with in human capital? It was 500, like 500 or something. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we really did take account for what was out there. Um, validation of our short lists. Um, okay, so this is something that came up during our process. Was not part of the initial um, uh, initiative set, but um, came out of our process Dur during our discussions with the investment community and, and during our, our working group. Um, the, the idea around narrative reporting really um, started to emerge. Um, if I can remember the way one of our um, asset managers put it, he said, look, the, 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 the metrics alone are not going to be sufficient. That's all we come up with out of embankment. That's not going to be sufficient. Um, and the visual I have in my mind is, is an organization needs to put up their strategy, needs to articulate its long-term goal, um, needs to put up the signposts, which perhaps are the metrics, but along the way they need to narrate that and, and provide updates for, um, and, and, and so really this idea of the narrative around those metrics is what's really needed and really important. Um, and then recognizing gaps and, and, and next steps, that was part of our process as well. Okay, so let me just get to kind of, I'm gonna tee this up for Ant a bit here, but 
Um, the human capital working group. What, what did we do in, in, in our working group? Um, I will say this, um, this working group started out not as human capital. It started out as employee engagement. And it was soon into the process and maybe, um, uh, maybe Ant already knew this was where it was, would head, but, um, I certainly didn't. We, we realized that the employee engagement wasn't all that meaningful to investors. We were hearing that theme over and over. What was meaningful is, um, how you utilize your human capital, how you, um, you know, utilization, retention, deployment of your human capital story. That, that's what was meaningful aside from turnover. That was sort of the only thing that um, really resonated with the investors that we had surveyed during our process. Um, and, and sort of the need for consistent, comparable way to communicate. So we, uh, we had some objectives going in. We wanted to make sure we were doing some uh, statistical review, exploring narrative reporting, coming up with principles around good narrative reporting, and then developing a case study uh, around that. So um, again, we used some academic research. Um, um, which you, you'll, Ant will sort of um, talk about in, in a little more detail. Um, so this was, so where did we get to? Um, ultimately after our process, um, which involved a, a, a lot of um, uh, research, a lot of interviews, discussion, um, we did determine that there were five categories of human capital um, that we wanted to focus on, um, which you can see up here, they're in our report as well. Um, that um, was really the that that was really the um, the the most important thing that came from our human capital work, and I think those these line up um, fairly yeah, closely to what you mm -hmm. came up with. Um, so, um, what what was our sort of conclusions after all of this, and wh where are we headed? Um, this this isn't rocket science again, but this is very. Uh, we we felt like this was important. Uh, employees are intangible assets of an organization with real value that doesn't exist on the balance sheet today, um, largely under dis disclosed by, by firms. Um, utilization, retention, and deployment of those assets, like any asset that you would measure on your balance sheet, um, is really important. And, and, and disclosure is a key differentiator. Um, and the ability for a company to accurately articulate its long-term value story around human capital is incredibly important and, and perhaps the, the, um, the bridge that speaks to the investors of tomorrow. Um, and, and finally, again, organizations should be evaluating, monitoring, and assessing their human capital. Um, so that's where we are today. Um, I didn't mention a lot of the good, really cool research we did in this space because I, I didn't want to steal some thunder from Ant, but um, maybe I can turn it over to you with the clicker, the green button. And uh, you've got uh, your presentation, but I know you're going to mention some of the research we did. Okay, it's quite interesting for me because I, I wasn't aware that um, it was the first time I've heard your confession that you yeah. didn't think you were <laughs> <laughs> either, I, either into human capital or into pretty much anything in, in this kind of space. I didn't space. know I was going to um, confess until We, we had to use a big brown stick to keep him out of the office most of the days because he couldn't it's get special. enough. I mean, he really, so you were well and truly converted. Um, I, th I think it's quite interesting just listening to the discussion and I sat in this morning sessions as well, which were really interesting and, and listening to Sally talking about her obsession with regression analyses. Um, I kind of share that same passion, um, but the challenge that I was given by Epic was that I had to turn this intangible value thing into something that was going to be analytically robust. And of course, Einstein said that, you know, we call things intangible for a reason, you know, we can't count them. So already we had quite, what I would say was a, a vigorous challenge. Um, and we also have the problem with human capital. Um, so, you know, I often talk to CFOs, particularly uh, associated with Epic, but also elsewhere, um, that they'll often say, look, you know, I really need HR to talk to me, you know, not in PowerPoint, but in Excel. And the problem is, you know, with um, HR people, you know, there, there are only three types of HR people. There, there are those that can count and those that can't. Uh, I'll just let that settle. Yeah, okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not sure where the asset management industry is on the basis of that joke, but we'll see how we go. Anyway, right. Um, so, so without further ado, let, let's. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to tell you the kind of story quite quickly in a way because um, a I've told it a lot of times, and b um, actually I, I'd like us to get into the discussion because one of the the main reasons why I've you know journeyed over the pond really was that um, you represent 
an absolute um, you know, population of people that I, I really want to engage with much more closely in this space. And that was the gift really that EY gave me. Uh, um, I kind of done a similar research for the UK government several years before. And uh, my boss for a year was Vince Cable um, together with Mark Carney. So it was funded by both the Treasury and the Bank of England. And, and that all came about, you might remember the story with HP and they bought a company in the UK called Autonomy. And then they wrote down a tremendous amount of value um, several years later. And that was when um, the Secretary of State banged his hand on the desk um, because actually writing off that kind of value meant that Her Majesty's revenues, customs and excise actually took a hit as well as far as value is concerned. So it was kind of, you know, who's going to rid me of this troublesome intangible value was kind of, and that's where the Hesketh kind of guy turned up, you know, not quite a drunken knight, but and, and certainly not being knighted on the back of it, but I did that for the, for the UK government. And that's how I, my, my sort of um, star rose with EY. Um, and they kicked out Cambridge and put in Lancaster, which I think was probably the smartest move they ever made. Anyway, um, so if I could have my um, slides up, please. Um, well, you invited an academic, so it was always going to happen. Um, but here we are. So this is the problem. You know, this is what I lie in bed thinking about at night. Um, as you can see, I don't get out a lot. And um, part of the problem is that the debate on both sides of that equation is fascinating to most of you in this room. A lot of you will spend a lot of time thinking about the relationships along this equation. But ultimately, that dependent variable over there, um, that's why I, I found it fascinating what Sally said this morning and then, and then listening to the, the session um, with Laurie and Celia as well, is basically the problem is what I call the modality of value. So the way that we value value now is changing. We know that the relationship between society and organized capitalism is somewhat strained. And at the same time, um, society wants to understand what capitalism is up to in its name and with its money, quite frankly. And capitalism and organized capitalism and institutional investment actually is kind of doing quite a lousy job in being very transparent in that space. And if I could be really contentious to warm it up, you know, for the debate later, I would probably say that, you know, America is pretty opaque in the reporting space in this area. And so that is, I've taken that on as a kind of personal challenge. But nevertheless, um, the whole idea about, you know, sort of what constitutes performance, what constitutes robust data is a really interesting issue in terms of what we were trying to get at. And so what we did in Epic, we, we went from 500 variables down to 50. We got it down to 10. We got it down to five. We got it down to one that the team absolutely thought was the one variable that we wanted. And then we built up to uh, what were eight or nine, principally because we wanted to be able to calculate what I wanted to call the human capital asset. Because obviously, I had a one eye on my Nobel Prize at the same time although I think it's more likely to be uh, Lynn Rothschild or Paul Pullman, whoever picks that one up. But we've got a problem on the other side, which is um, what's going on with um, the human capital itself. So, you know, fascinating this morning to look at this, you know, sort of the issue around meritocracy and around bias and around how we measure these things. And this whole notion around the modality of value for me was how do we get hold of this analytically? I'm talking, I'm absolutely preaching to the converted in the room here, is how do, how do analysts do their analysis? With what do we do our analysis with in the human capital space? And how can that analysis, and also how can the disclosure of the data that we create and the value points actually enable us then to talk a much better game to society about one, the long-term value that firms are creating, and two, probably more importantly, what role or what does the relationship look like with wider stakeholders for firms? So we're not just talking about current employees, potential employees, former employees who might want to come back because actually it was quite a nice place to work. But we're also talking about customers. We're talking about business partners, collaborators, all sorts of different things. So it's not just about how you do business and how you do business with your people, but it's also about who you do business with and how they do their business with their people and whether they're the kind of people that you people want to do business with. So these, these are really big issues that are starting to shift value in, in very material ways. So um, these were the, the kind of indicators that we decide to get into on the right-hand side. And Eric's already talked a little bit about all of those. 
Um, just so you know, the number one indicator that everybody really went for was actually turnover. A, it was a quantum data point. And secondly, they, it really gave you an idea of what was going on inside a firm. If I was choosing any of all these indicators on this list, and certainly the one that, you know, maybe the SEC might rule to make actually an obligation, a compulsory to report rather than discretionary, I would say it's the total costs of the workforce to include their salaries, benefits, and so on. Why? Because that is the golden denominator. You know, that actually is the goose analytically that will lay all of our analytical golden eggs because what use or how fair can fair value be if we don't even know what the total spend is? And we have that problem with US data right now. And that was one of the big issues around long-term value that we actually wanted to fix that opacity as far as organizations were concerned. And quite interestingly enough, uh, those variables, um, thanks to Cambria and her team and Epic and others, and there's a, a whole host of different people and different initiatives working in this space. And we're now getting to a point where I'm starting to read equity analysts' reports quite frequently now that are actually starting to use human capital indicators in their fair value analysis. So it's clearly part of the story now. Uh, which I find fascinating. So what we did was, um, if you want the sort of long version of this, we can talk about it over a drink um, outside. Um, but ultimately what we decided to do was we came up with a human capital reporting index. So in essence, it was how deep and how wide do organizations report in the human capital indicators? So the kinds of indicators we we're looking at were workforce costs, turnover, training and development, uh, what we call workforce composition in which diversity and inclusion and equality issues were all contained inside that. We had an incredibly broad and inclusive church as far as analysis was concerned. And again, I can get into the technicalities of that um, at a later date. But ultimately, what we did was that we then looked at all of the um, investor relations publications by firms so we could actually see what they had to say and what they signed off themselves. And two very quick things on that. Um, the first one, which I think is quite interesting, is that um, a lot of firms report a lot of data, but they report a lot of data in a lot of places, which makes your job very difficult in just ter terms of time. You know, the opportunity cost of actually pulling that stuff together, where it could actually be drawn together, uh, to seem ludicrous to us. But the story was quite fascinating. So in the UK, on this index, we took, um, we compared the quartile performance. So those firms in the top quartile who reported more widely and more deeply than other firms in that top quartile there, um, somebody mentioned the data this morning, uh, for every pound or dollar, it works by the way, in either currency, just for the mathematical point, but anyway. Um, so it's not a, a translation issue. Uh, it might be between maths and HR, but that's not the story. Anyway, but the, but the point here is, is that, um, you know, for every pound that you invest in your people, you're, you're, you're getting a 300% return. Whereas um, that's a significant difference with those firms that seem to understand or themselves less or a little bit more opaque. Now, I find that data fascinating. That's just one year there. It repeats every year and that um, linear pattern gets tighter every year as the, the market in this space matures. So I think that's fascinating. I'll come on to what that might mean later. This is one of my favorite slides here. So in the dark bars, they're the firms in the US that actually report their full workforce costs. It's a tiny percentage, 13% of firms in the US, S&P 500 report their workforce costs. But when you look at those firms, you can see that actually they outperform operationally, whether you want to call it EBIT, EBITDA, you know, net profit margin, and of course the retention ratio there, which of course then is the perfect opposite when you look at the payout ratio. And those firms actually that aren't disclosing in that uh, their human capital and other indicators seem to have a slightly more shareholder focus on them as opposed to a long-term one. Again, I could get into the details behind that data and I haven't time to do that right now, but that's fascinating. And of course you get the challenges from the asset management industry. Well, that's all very well, you know, that's your index and what about our indexes? What about our data points? What about the way we do our analysis? Well, hey, guess what? You know, if you actually want to look at this in terms of means excess returns, uh, you know, the company standard, 
Um, okay, I'd like to see less volatility in there, although I know some of you like a bit of volatility thrown in for good measure. But nevertheless, um, this data is quite interesting. So from my point of view, at the very least, if I was being really, really conservative and I was being um, a reviewer for you know a blind piece of academic reviewing on a, an academic journal that was put in front of me, I would certainly say that I'm looking at data that enables me to reject the null hypothesis. You know, human capital is material, ladies and gentlemen. It actually matters. And if the job of um, directors of a firm is to report on anything material, as far as the performance of the business is concerned, in the UK in 2013, we passed a law that basically said that all um, firms had to formally state what their level of materiality was for their financial statements. That's normally around about one and a half to five percent of revenues. When we take that formal material figure and put, actually then put that and compare that against the spend on human capital by those organizations, you can see from this data point, which summarizes the whole FTSE 100, that actually um, you've got um, half of the FTSE 100 um, you know, exceeding the, the level of materiality. The spend on their human capital is by a factor of 20. And in the UK, we're quite good at reporting because we have a lot more regulatory space. We operate under European IFRS, so we have to report our workforce costs. Um, and there's a whole host of other things as a result of that. If you look at the US, however, um, what we find in the US is that, you know, um, we have this wonderful um, medium proxy statement <laughs> form where, where, where you give us that data point, which is useless from an analytical point of view, and it creates all sorts of other kinds of issues. But at the very least, my challenge to you will be to say that actually um, US firms are breaking their fiduciary responsibility insofar as they are actually not reporting on a whole host of these spaces. Now, the US is starting to improve and improve quite dramatically. So for me, there's kind of three very, very quick points I'd want to make. The first one is don't get hung up on the um, leading indicator debate. You remember we had this discussion ad nauseum in, in, in um, Epic, where I was basically saying, you know, and, and again, I, I, I'm not preaching to the converted here. I'm absolutely challenging the choir at the moment, which is most of this industry, most of you in this room aren't going to shift anything until you feel like you have a leading indicator in place that makes you feel like you've got a robust case. What the challenge now is, in my view, as far as Epic is concerned, is actually you've got to decide what the indicators are that society and industry wants to lead by. What do you want to report on, actually? And that will then create a different kind of marketplace. The second one is around veracity. You know, so one, the first one is around lead, leading the leading indicator. The second piece is around veracity. The problem is, is that there, that, you know, excuse the pun, but you know, that we are in the state of the wild west as far as human capital indicators are concerned. Anything goes. So what we've tried to do in Epic, and I would really, you know, sort of encourage you to go and read it. And the ISO standards that have come out as, on the back of that as well are, are very worthwhile and useful in terms of a common standard that is now starting to be used. Is that we need that that veracity. And once we've got that veracity in place we can then build models that actually are going to be much more robust and give us an insight. And if the research that we've conducted so far in ROIT is anything to go by, I think those models are going to start revealing different types of leading indicators to us, which is very exciting. And that brings me to the last point, which brings me right back to where Cambria is probably going to lead off from, which is around governance. So at this point in time, whether the SEC decide to rule I doubt very much whether the House of Congress is going to make much progress, um, given that it's got to then go up to Senate, which might get a bit of a roasting, I would imagine, given the predisposition of Republicans not towards any kind of regulation in this space. I think we have all kinds of issues. But ultimately, we have to start reporting. We have to put our house in order. The opacity must stop. Because, you know, if I could leave you with one final point, you know, if you think about my graduates when they're leaving Lancaster, um, you need straight A's to go to Lancaster. It's quite a strong institution. I'm not going to do too many adverts for us, but you know, check us out all the same. Send your kids to us. We're much cheaper than you would be in one of the schools in the US. That's, another, so that's a very good, efficient way of going forwards. But actually, um, when, they, when they're graduating with their great degree and they're deciding which company they're going to go and work for, it might be a 50-year deal. They're going to work to their 70 now. Um, they're probably unlikely to work for one company, but potentially they might do so. On what basis do they make the decision about 
what is the level of evidence about which firm I go and work for? Is it the quality of biscuits at the assessment center? Is it because my dad or my mum worked for them or my brother had a good time or whatever it might necessarily be? We, we need to be much more transparent about what's going on. So on the one hand, there's a performance case. And on the other hand, there's a much bigger social capital element in that space as well. And on that, Cambria, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. This is all very fascinating. I just want to do a quick time check on how much time do we have? Oh, they're resetting the oh. clock. There we go. All right, perfect. <laughs> so uh, the first question I wanted to ask you guys, um, you know, with Epic, what has been the the feedback that you've gotten for your work from you know from the marketplace, from other stakeholders? Um, you know, what what's the reception been? Yeah. So do you want me to? Start. I mean, everything I've heard to date has been really positive. We got a lot of good press in November when the um, when Epic launched. Uh, I think the um, the proof of that is really what's been going on since then. Um, and there's been a lot of discussions with a lot of interested organizations in what's going on with Phase Two. Mm -hmm. If you look at the approach that was taken, it really only included, despite it being you know 30 trillion in assets under management, it really only included. Um, a, uh, nine asset creators, mm -hmm. was it? Um, and uh, in a few different sectors. And um, we've started to see interest from other organizations saying, well, geez, um, it's no secret. J&J &J was, was involved. They were the ones that led the um, human capital mm -hmm. working group. Others in their sector are now saying, geez, what, you know, why, why weren't we included? Mm -hmm. And maybe we need to get involved. And um, so I think that that, that reception has been positive. Um, I th I think yeah I don't know Aunt what you wanna you've been involved in discussions with Lady Lynn as well mm -hmm. post Epic and, and probably have even more recent insight there. Um, well, I, I think long term value generically has captured people's imaginations. I think people want that stretch um, over time, uh, that security in some ways. From a human capital point of view, I think it's been really fascinating insofar as. Um, I've always been this advocate that, um, I mean, Pacioli got it wrong half a millennium ago. Um, you know, pop them on the income statement as a cost because, of course, employees were 10 a penny. You know, you just, you actually went out and clubbed people over the head and put them on a ship, you know, and, and sailed them somewhere, you know, as far as the artisans were concerned. And, 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 they, and, and that was basically an employee. And it didn't get much better a couple of hundred years later, you know, when Adam Smith and others were writing, whether it was in pin factories or in you know, agricultural economics, um, again, you know, employees were, you know, people that you could basically, they would dig a furrow, they, they would build, build a hay bale or whatever. You know, again, things are slightly more different now. So um, I don't think it's right to look at um, human capital as the gasoline that you run through the engine that you source as, you know, as cheaply as possible. I think it's the engine itself. And actually you need to, you know, if we start looking at human capital as an engine, I think that's the, the, the big difference I've seen post Epic is that I think if someone had said to me that the SEC would have been contemplating having a round table, um, starting the discussion around what variables need to be reported, whether they need to be compulsory or not. If you said to me that would happen within five years of Epic, I would have said probably not. If you said to me that it was happening within five months of the publication of Epic, I would have laughed at you and yet here we are. So there's clearly something going on as far as that's concerned. Um, and, I, you know, and I think progress on, on the Hill is probably, or at least it making the discussion on the Hill is also a reflection of the zeitgeist that, that Epic captured. I think the human capital space probably captured more of that because uh, we had quite a robust set of analytics around that space. And we focused on that space principally because we knew it was woolly and we wanted to sort that out. And I think it's really important that it's also worth mentioning that the big impact now is that whereas previously there's been, um, so I, I think um, one SEC committee member who will remain nameless during the debate uh, came out with this wonderful phrase saying, I do not want the camel's nose to get inside the tent. I don't want this kind of invasion inside organizations around the competitive advantage or whatever it might necessarily be. And yet actually, the zeitgeist is very much against that. And you can think of you know, the firms, you only have to go down the list of the firms that were involved in Epic. $30 trillion under management, you know, sort of the largest investment um, 
asset managers in the world involved. And they are basically turning around and saying, which is what the SEC recognized, that we want you now to rule in this space. We actually want this data. We think this data is pertinent and actually material to our financial considerations. So it's high time now that we define this data so we can compare onions with onions. And that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, I'll just maybe just add two things. Um, one, um, I think it was very easy for many of the investors that we were working with to get very excited about some of the research we were doing, which you presented the ROIT information. And, um, and I think there's a, a general sense, Cambria, that um, you know they want to see more in that space. Like mm -hmm. we've shown disclosure um, correlation mm -hmm. with performance. We want to see um, causation and how do we get to that. So I think there's that piece. The other piece that's happened is I, I'm in the consulting business and this has been a great platform to have discussion. I haven't met a CFO, CEO, executive at an organization that um, hasn't found this fascinating. Mm -hmm. They want to talk about this, which um, I don't know that I could have predicted that before. This wouldn't have been a topic I would have taken into a CFO before, but um, that's it's been a great platform for us to engage in discussions. They're all interested in this and they find the work that we've done fascinating around this space. So um, those yeah. are two additional. No, I, I would totally, and for the HCMC's um, experience, we, um, we're we doing a project right now where we reached out to about 30 uh, large corporations in the US and asked them a set of questions. Um, what's your human capital management strategy? How does that tie in with your business strategy? What uh, metrics are you collecting? What are you doing with that information? How do you use it as feedback to inform your business? And those conversations are getting much better. Um, and I think over that, you know, over that period of time, uh, even in, you know, in the boardrooms are talking about this a lot more, um, which is, which is really important. Some companies even have human capital management committees. Um, and also you have the role of the chief HR officer, which, you know, this is a shift from sort of the, the risk management, you know, make sure we don't get sued today to a really a strategic partner mm. in, you know, within the management team and in the boardroom. So there has been, you know, quite a bit happening very quickly. And that's why these conversations are so important. Um, because, you know, there, I think there still is a bit of uncertainty around this, but you know, we can't, we can't address that if we're not engaging in this dialogue. So, um, so uh, we do have, uh, we have about seven and a half minutes. Maybe we can cover uh, compulsory versus voluntary <laughs> <laughs> period of time, probably not, but, but let's start the conversation because this is, you know, this is really a key question that's happening. I mean, I think you've heard um, from Eric and from, from Ant and um, many, probably other, other Places, you know, we're all we're all recognizing the importance of human capital, I and mean, I don't think that's really a debate. Um, but the question is, again, how to get there. So, um, from the human capital uh, coalition HCMC uh, perspective, you know, there we we've always acknowledged that there are going to be metrics that are uh, universal to companies. These are just descriptive ones. Turnover, I think, is a perfect example, cost of the workforce. Uh, but also metrics vary, um, you know, from one industry to another. Uh, we found that from the very beginning, even when we started talking to retail companies, you know, even, you know, from one company to another, depending on what their strategy is. Uh, but I know that we don't all, you know, necessarily agree on, on that piece. So I'm going to start with Eric. I'll turn it over to Ann and you know, jump in. Sure. And I know we're a bit short of time. I'll, I'll just share. This is an area where I'm really concerned, I would say, mm -hmm. um, partly because I, I lived through the disclosure effectiveness in this, in the sort of chief accounting officer space, et cetera, and saw, you know, what some of the things that happened with some of the SASB initiatives, et cetera. Um, so a couple thoughts here. Um, I think the best thing to do with Epic right now or human capital metrics right now is to let this breathe. And, and I'm a little worried about it going down the, the compulsory space. The, the kind of discussions I'm describing we're having with CFOs and, and, and others that handle, that are owners of the sort of financial reporting that gets done today, the 10K, the section 16 officers that are signing off on that. Um, they would shut down a, a conversation pretty quickly if I were to go in and, and say, 
and we're looking to make you, you know, to require you to disclose this information. The, the simple reality is we're finding that many of them aren't even like disclosing it within their organization all that well. And there's not, let's start there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just think, I believe that there's a much better way to pull this information from the top down, from boards, from, and we've talked about this, um, than going down this sort of compulsory rulemaking route, which I think will, it has its consequences. And you have to think about it. I mean, look what happens when you have new disclosures in, in the financial reporting world. What happens? They become template, uh, sort of very scripted. Um, it's not a lot of information. The goal at that point is to check the box. It's not to provide good detailed information. And we have so much momentum here right now. It was all built on a foundation of, of open, we don't know where we're going, transparent. Let's all volunteer to be in this ecosystem together and build something good. I worry that I worry about killing that um, a, a bit. So that that's my biggest concern. I guess the other piece to this, and I'll say this quickly, is you have to think about um, how this would get implemented within an organization. The reality is the Section 16 officers today are not the same people that produce the um, the this type of information today. Much of this information is coming from other parts of the organization to which the those Section 16 officers are not. There's not even a dotted line, perhaps, mm -hmm. in terms of reporting. So you would have to address organizationally. There would be some some challenges um, there. So I'll given timing, I'll kind of stop yeah, there. But right. obviously, that's that's my. I'm all for the human capital disclosures, but the approach we're taking and the next steps and compulsory, I'm I'm not for that. Well, let me ask a question before I turn to Ann, because yeah. I know Ann has uh, as strong reasons on this as well. What about? Um, so one of the things that we've we've kind of been talking about is turnover, right? I mean, we're all pretty much in agreement. That's actually that's you know that's a ratio, right? Yeah. It's, it's not um, you know it's something that could be cleanly I think defined yeah. um, from a reporting perspective versus something like um, human rights commitments. You know that's something that it's more of a narrative. Maybe uh, how do you think? How do you feel about that? I mean, is there a way to to bifurcate the approach? So um, let me let me share a quick story. So one of the things we did with all of the um, working group members was we did our own assessment. Each working group member did their own assessment of where they're what metrics they're reporting of the mm -hmm. five that we came up with, eight depending on how you count. Mm -hmm. um, and um, J and J, as you know, led this. They, if you look at their Health for Humanities report that was just released, we just got a note from their investor relations group. They included turnover now for uh, which with the, which they hadn't been including that information before. So my, I guess, answer to that is this process is working. Mm. Keep going, keep pushing the pull versus the push. And I think you'll get more and, you, and you'll get more transparent information. So um, I agree, it's easier. That one's easier to sort of get uh, more consistency and it's very tired. But then you get into questions around, all right, well, shouldn't turnover matters in the context of the employee and the, the employee base. So then you're going to, is it with key employees? Is it turnover with key employees? Is it with mm -hmm. certain geographies? Is it, and, and are you going to sort of make that compulsory? If So I think there's some challenges. Again, you want to drive, let's get some, let's get some momentum going mm -hmm. with this. And then once you start having more information out there, it's going to be easier to then rule make, um, the consistency element there. So let's pop my over to, to Ant. Well, on the current level of momentum, Eric, we're you know <laughs> sort of T minus five hundred years, maybe. Um, you know, another you know, another Pacioli might come around at that particular time. So, I mean, I, I totally disagree. I mean, I, I actually think it's time to to get you know capitalism's house in order, and I think that was very much the inclusive capitalism coalition's idea, which is just fix the relationship between society and business. And one of the quickest ways of doing that is to be transparent. So the UK experience was really interesting. So with Sir Vince, um, very adept politician, and quite a clever chap, you know, he used to be the chief economist for Shell, so he's no slouch. Um, and I remember Vince saying, you know, well, why don't we just put this out to society, let, take the Eric approach, you know, which the Eric Bradbury approach is always, you know, gonna be the one that most consultants advocate, don't upset the clients. And also we thought that society would actually, you know, basically, hold the firms to account so it would happen. And guess what, it didn't. So we legislated for gender and the gender pay divide, and now we're legislating for ethnicity and diversity, uh, which is coming on stream 
this year. And you know what? Nobody died. Um, and nobody went bankrupt, certainly not on the basis of their human capital indicators. Nobody lost any competitive advantage. But you know what? We've got a lot more data. We can start answering a lot more questions. So the kinds of issues that we heard about this morning earlier on don't come as surprises to us anymore. And not only do they not come as surprises to us in aggregate form, but we can actually look at them in individual organizations and make our own decisions about whether they're getting their houses in order. Because really, it just that enables you to, to quickly do, you know, sort of a, a quick set of questions, what I call the four plus five. You know, what's the strategy of the business? What's the role of people? How are they doing? How do you know? And then you've got the five analytical questions, you know, sort of what direction of travel is the performance of your people, you know, moving in? You know, sort of uh, where is most value located and being produced inside your business? Where would I invest? How do you compare against your competitors? You know, and, and, and ultimately, it's just looking after your people. You know, how good are we doing at that particular job? And if you're doing well with that, guess what? I imagine that the firm would perform quite well and, and just very quickly. The conclusion that we reached with Epic, so this is a bunch of CEOs, CFOs, Chief Operating Officers. Eric was even there too, and I think you kind of agreed with this as well. You know, we're the kind of Laura Notley of Epic. I think we're going to sell ourselves at some stage. Anyway, um, and, and what the kind of conclusion we reached was, was that these firms that seemed to be reporting more about what was going on within their own organizations, not just in the human capital space, but elsewhere, um, they had what I call quantum clarity. They were, they were managing their businesses well enough and they felt confident enough in that management to start putting out data points to be able to say, this is the direction of travel in which we are moving. And that seemed to make intuitive sense to us all at Epic that actually, you know, well-run firms are quite confident about putting their data out there, good, bad or ugly. One of my favorite firms who I would absolutely encourage you to go and have a look at in the human capital space, Novartis. Just, you know, quick look at their... Um, and report pages 25 to 27, bang, you know, you're away. <laughs> that's, that's the exemplar, that's what we're aiming for. Yeah, so, so we know what good looks like, we just need to make everybody do it, and then it'd be a lot that's easier. A, that's a perfect point to stop on, and also got homework for the audience, so I wanted to thank our uh, Eric and Ant for joining us today, and really uh, hope this was, was uh, helpful for everyone. Thank you. Thank you.